Hey there folks, this is Greeny XI welcoming you right back to Let's Play Yuminiko. This is episode 12. In the last episode, well, with the six corpses being found in the Rose Garden uh, tool shed, we had all the characters sort of giving their opinions on what might have happened, who might be the killer. Eva seemed to be the most vocal about it, uh, blaming the servants, but who knows? Who knows? <laughs> and Maria showed that she has incredible knowledge about the occult. We knew she liked it. But as a little girl, we wouldn't expect her to have this depth um, of it. Rivaling grandfather's uh, knowledge of it, apparently. Speaking of, he's gone vanishing, so who knows what's happened with him? Is he alive? Is he dead? Never know. But now, I want to show you something before we kick off. And that's just that I think this, episode one, I didn't actually read this out at the very start of... Of the series, so I want to check it out just a sec. So the first episode is called Legend of the Golden Witch, and you can see why as we're going through the story. We don't know if she's real, we don't know if she's not. Uh, she's just Beatrice is just this fairy tale. Um, it says, "Welcome to Rockinjima. The Golden Witch extends her heartfelt greetings. Please take it easy and relax for the time being. So, in other words, you're not going to figure much out this this arc. <laughs> uh, no need to think overly hard about any of this. Quietly accept all that is about to happen." That's all that's being asked of you. The difficulty level is standard. We might as well at least start by taking the easy road. <laughs> I like that, mind. The humanity behind the description of the, the, the arc. Anyways, 25th of March, that's the one. Let's get cracking. I think my cold has gone a bit now as well. So I'm very happy about that. Okay. So dinner is finished. Lunch ended, and the servants removed the tableware and went to the kitchen. The wind and rain neither weakened nor strengthened, and the island remained cut off from the outside world. At first, it seemed as though Natsui planned to stop anyone from taking a step outside the room. But when it came time to prepare lunch, she finally realised this would be impossible. However, in order to avoid having anyone alone in the kitchen, she told the three servants to go together. Oh yeah, that's a, someone else, isn't it? Natsui has the gun. Grandfather's gun. Mm. Because of that, the servants were the first ones given the right to leave the stuffy parlour, which had been packed with 11 people. Since breakfast had immediately followed that terrible incident, preventing most of us from eating much, everyone tore into their lunches in silence. Oh, I thought dinner was over. Oh, never mind. <laughs> I will wash the dishes, so you can rest a while, Kanon-kun, Genji-san. Do you want something to drink? I don't need anything. Kanon? I don't need anything either. I think a couple of the servants sort of go f fade into the background in the first arc. Like, they have their moments, but I don't think they're that interesting yet. Keep going. <laughs> you two must have been so busy and so early in the morning. It's no wonder you're worn out. The only noise was that of Kumasawa washing the dishes, which resounded throughout the kitchen. Genji and Kanan sat in some chairs a short distance away, their eyes lightly closed. Just as Kumasawa had said, those two had probably built up a great deal of fatigue. But that didn't mean they could let it show in front of the relatives. Avoiding that was one of their virtues. After the silence has continued for some time, Cannon opened his mouth and muttered, Shannon, why did you have to die in such a horrible way? Forget about the manner of her death. It was nothing more than bad luck. You're right. It was nothing more than bad luck. They both fell silent once again. Cannon's expression was filled with grief. To think that Shannon Chan's actually dead. I still can't believe it. Poor thing. Not being able to see her again feels like a lie. I just wanted to see her smiling face one more time. Kumasawa spoke with her back facing them. After all, Kumasawa hadn't seen Shannon's corpse, so she had no trouble mentioning Shannon's face. When Cannon heard those words, it reminded him again of how only half of Shannon's face had been left, and his grieving expression twisted even further. Why did Beatrice Sama do that to Shannon? If she wanted a sacrifice, there were plenty of others to choose from. Why? Why? It was nothing more than bad luck. If we were less lucky, you or I might have been lying out there instead of Shannon. Or it could have been someone else entirely. Everything is left to fate. Genji-sama, you said the door to Madam's room was stained with traces of something like blood, right? Natsui's room. The same substance that was painted on the shutter? Indeed. It was an unsettling mark, almost as though someone with blood-stained fingers had been trying to pull out the doorknob. 
No, scratched through the door. That sort of unpleasant mark. So does this mean? Beatrice Sammer came to visit Madam's room and tried to open the door, but couldn't? Genji thought back to the time he had seen those traces of blood on the door to Natsui's room, with the substance sticking to the door around the doorknob and the marks of something scratching against the door. It had definitely appeared as though someone had tried to open the door, but couldn't. How did the madam avoid being chosen as a sacrifice? If only she'd been chosen, Shannon wouldn't... Shannon wouldn't have had to die. Just then, a loud, sharp noise came in from the hall. Both of them turned around, surprised. That's a pretty interesting chat you're having there. Let me join in too. Ah, oh, did Battler hear everything? Before any of the servants realised it, Battler was standing in the doorway to the kitchen. Battler Sama, how rude of us. Genji San and Kanankun stood up, surprised, and hastily bowed. But I didn't care about stuff like that. I was more concerned with continuing their discussion. I told them I was going to the bathroom, so they let me go. I thought I'd suffocate if I was locked up in that room any longer. I was about to come ask you guys for some water, but then I overheard something pretty interesting. You don't need to bow your heads or anything. Please, let me hear the rest. That just now wasn't really... I've been listening to you for a while. Don't try to hide it now. So, I'll ask directly. Who's this Beatrice? She's supposed to be a witch from a kid's story, but it doesn't look that way now. Kanakun averted his gaze. It was obvious that he didn't want to talk about this, which only made me want to ask even more. While making an effort to smile, I grabbed the collar of his shirt. Last night, this would have been none of my business, but after this morning, everything's changed. Now that Dad and the rest have been killed, this is totally my business. I have the right to listen to this suspicious story, don't I? I glared into Cannon's eyes as he continued to avert his gaze in apparent pain. Since there was a big difference in our heights, Cannon had to stand on his toes and it looked like it hurt a bit. Battler-san, please let go of him. Cannon-san isn't really hiding anything. Then he won't have any problem talking about it, right? It's lonely being out of the loop, you know. When I tried to further twist up his collar, Genji-san cut between us and spoke. In his expression were faint traces that he'd made up his mind to do something. Apparently, he had no intention of hiding it. I can tell you about it. Kanan only hesitated because he might have taken it badly, Battler Sama. Hesitating, huh? Not very manly of you. Whatever it is you're talking about, it's even more unpleasant having it kept a secret. Tell me about it. It's not like we have anything better to do before tomorrow comes. A slightly spooky story might be the best way to avoid getting bored. Genji-san and Kanakun looked at each other, then nodded as though they decided to talk. Understood. Please ask us anything. We will talk. Right. Then I'll ask. Who in the world is Beatrice? All I know is that she's a witch who lives in the forest of Okanjima. I've heard it's a story grandmother or someone invented to keep people out of the dangerous forest. Is that wrong? No, it isn't wrong. It's as you say. Beatrice is a witch who dwells in the forest of Okanjima. Patlasama, I don't expect you to believe this all of a sudden, but Beatrice-sama exists. She is a real person, the one who gave the master a vast amount of gold and who worked by his side for many years. Hmm? Ah, oh, come on. Is grandfather paying you to repeat everything he says? I laughed like it was a joke, but neither Genji-san nor Kanangun laughed, not even Kumasawa Ba-chan who was avoiding my eyes, flustered, as she started washing the dishes. So unfortunately, I was the only one laughing. Painfully, bitterly. I see, that's why Genji-san refused to mention it. If you really mention it, of course I'd take it badly. So, you're saying that a person named Beatrice actually exists? Yes. She has been working for the Master since before the mansion was built on this island. She has most likely been working for him even longer than I have. What you know, Kyrie-san's theory was off. Grandfather really did have a confidant called Beatrice. Is that person on the island now? Yes. I believe that she is here. That's a vague way to say it. I guess that means you haven't seen her face today or yesterday. That's correct. It is extremely difficult to say, but... um, Kanakum once again dropped his gaze, avoiding my eyes. Come on, don't just stop there. That's like freezing an inch before the blow, right? I urged him on joke jokingly again, 
However, look like Kanan was still confused as to whether he should speak or not. Then, Kumasawa Barchan whispered. Ho ho ho. You cannot see her face. Because Beatrice-sama has no form. She has no... What did you say? Beatrice-sama has no body. Therefore, unless Beatrice-sama wishes it, common people like us are not able to see her form. I have heard that the portrait shows what Beatrice-sama looked like back when she had a human form. It seems he yearned for that figure so much, he would often stand in front of that portrait. Oh ho ho. Beatrice-sama sometimes shows herself by changing her form into glittering butterflies. On the rare occasion that they spot them somewhere in the mansion, there's a rule that you absolutely mustn't chase after them. I think Shannon did, didn't she, when she saw him? It's whispered that you will meet with disaster if you do. In fact, there was a servant who broke that rule and quit because of a great injury. Wait a sec, are you kidding me? Are you all serious about this? Rattler-sama, Beatrice-sama has already arrived. Such language may be unwise. Beatrice-sama does not like it when she is profaned. If you doubt her existence, you will surely meet with a disaster. Batlasan, you'll probably find this topic unpleasant. But you know what? Beatrice Sama does exist. She exists. Beatrice Sama hates people who doubt that. Can't you tell, Batlasama? Beatrice Sama has already arrived here. Come on, quit it. I'm weak against that stuff. Enough with the cheap threats. However, there's no trace of a joke in the eyes of the three servants. On the surface, I laughed and tried to look unconcerned, but I was quickly starting to sober up. Their eyes were also sobering up fast. Batlasan, I beg that you stop profaning Beatrice Amma. Please trust me. Kumasawa Bachan, who was usually cheerful and would always tease people, now spoke with a totally serious face. Well, well, even if you say she exists, I don't see anything. You trying to say she's standing right next to me or something? Quit joking around. Oh, hello, Maria. <laughs> Just then, that unnerving laugh suddenly filled the kitchen. When I turned around, Maria was standing there by the entrance. But her expression and the feeling about her, her presence, felt exactly the same as the servant's. Whether you, your wavelength matches or not is determined at birth. Butler, you were born with a mismatched wavelength. <laughs> that's why you can't see her. That's why you can't meet with her. And that's why you can't talk to her. <laughs> You're the type Beatrice hates the most. Maria laughed like it was funny, but it sounded extremely eerie. It was almost like she was laughing at me because I alone didn't understand. Do you want to know about Beatrice? Beatrice is a thousand-year-old witch. With all the demons at her command, she can harness the power of alchemy to create the Philosopher's Stone and a vast quantity of gold. Grandfather built up all the vast wealth of the Yashuramaya family by making a contract with her. Yesterday, I read Beatrice's letter, didn't I? That was real. Well, I guess it's pointless for me to try and force you to believe. After all, looks like you were born without a trace of the sixth sense. Hee hee hee. What are you talking about? Witches? Demons? Who told you about that? <laughs> I heard it from Beatrice herself. <laughs> Maria kept doing that unpleasant laugh instead of the ooh ooh. However, the servants who watched over this didn't even blink. <clears throat> she heard it from that witch in the portrait adorning the entrance hall. Maria kept on laughing in a weird voice as though this was nothing more or less than the truth. Maria, it might be rude to ask, but I'll ask one more time, okay? Who gave you that letter yesterday? I got it from Beatrice. How many times must I tell you before you understand? You don't get it, do you? You can't see it. You can't believe it, can you? <laughs> Just then, Maria's laughter suddenly stopped. Battler, you still don't understand? Beatrice Sama exists. She exists, you say, but where? Like I said, Beatrice Sama exists here. That's right. Now that I think about it, I've been feeling for a while now that the servant's eyes haven't been pointed in quite the right direction. I'd figured they were just staring absent-mindedly, but that wasn't the case. The four here, Genji-san, Kanan-kun, Kumasawa-san, and Maria, everyone except me, was looking at a spot right behind me. Holding my breath tightly, I slowly looked over my shoulder. Of course, there wasn't anyone there. 
I've known that the whole time. However, everyone in the room except me was focusing on that point as if there was someone there. Beatrice is the mighty golden witch who has lived for a thousand years, but since she can't show her form to humans of the wrong wavelength, she can't talk to them. And you know what? That's really sad. It means she truly despises it when people like you, who were born without a fragment of the ability needed to sense magic, deny that she exists. You're lucky, battler. Good thing I gave you that charm yesterday, right? Don't you realise what kind of curse Beatrice would have put on you by now, if you hadn't been carrying it around? You really are lucky, battler. <laughs> oh, that scorpion keychain. I thought that was just some cheap gift or something. But are you saying it really had some power? <laughs> if it weren't for that, you'd be lying in that storehouse as a sacrifice with your face crushed by now. You're so lucky, Battler. <laughs> I see. So if it weren't for that, I'd have been killed by now. Battler, why don't you believe in Beatrice? Even though she exists, right now, over there, look. <laughs> hey, I'll bet you want to believe it now. Believe it. And thank me for giving you that charm. If it weren't for that, you'd be in the storehouse right now. But then, maybe you would have saved someone else in exchange, right? <laughs> right then, I burst into laughter. Playing witches have been pretty fun up until a second ago, but unfortunately, that last one seemed to be too much for me to gloss over. Ha! <laughs> then it's all useless, isn't it, Maria? If that's true, then I'm sorry, but it's all useless. When Maria saw me suddenly start laughing, she stopped. Even though she didn't understand what I was laughing at, she realised it wouldn't be pleasant for her. I thought it might hurt you, so I didn't say it earlier, but... Mm, I thought I'd put that charm you gave me in my pocket. I must have dropped it somewhere. So the charm can't be the only reason I'm alive now. And even though I should have been cursed by the witch, I'm perfectly fine. Sorry, but I don't believe in things I don't see with my own eyes. Six senses, wavelengths, magic sensitivity... Sorry, but I don't believe in fake stuff like that. When I hear the girls in class start talking about how good or bad their ability to sense the supernatural is, it pisses me off. I don't know how much Grandfather is paying you, but if you're trying to talk me into joining some cult, believe me, you won't be able to do it that easily. Battle Sama. You guys are free to believe whatever you want. However, when it comes to the things I believe, the one who decides is always me. Sorry, but I can't believe in something as shady as Beatrice until I've seen it with my own eyes. I spoke forcefully and sharply. Then Maria started crack uh, cackling again. <laughs> uh, that's just fine, isn't it? Eventually, even people like you with totally mismatched wavelengths will be able to see Beatrice. Very soon, she will revive. Beatrice will revive. Once that happens, she's promised to talk with me and play with me a lot. There'll be absolutely no need for you to doubt or for us to force you to believe. She will appear very soon. <laughs> Okay. Weird chat with the servants of Maria. Yeah, and Battler. After a meal, some people tend to head to the bathroom, while others prefer to relax for a bit. It seemed that several people had left the parlour, just like I did when I went to the kitchen to drink some water. In the end, Aunt Natsui reluctantly retracted her order that everyone remain packed into the parlour on the condition that no one headed out on their own or strayed too far. In any case, if 11 people are shut up in the same room, starting early in the morning, the air will start to stagnate. Also, quite some time had passed, so everyone was starting to recover from the shock of the morning, and their sense of danger might have been weakening too. However, it was a certain fact that six people had been killed inside this mansion, so no one was completely negligent. So whenever they went out into the hallway for a breath of fresh air, trying to act tough, they would quickly get scared of standing there, isolated, and would eventually return to the parlour. I guess it's like the north wind and the sun. If you force someone to stay shut in, they'll resist. But if you tell them to do what they want, they'll come back obediently. People really do not do like not doing what they're told. Uh, <laughs> when the servants finished cleaning up from the meal, they returned obediently to the parlour, just as Nan Aunt Natsui had told them to, and sat on a sofa near the entrance, patiently awaiting orders. Maria, almost as though she had suddenly finished playing witches, had returned to the pure Maria I knew well, saying, Ooh, ooh. What in the world happened back there? 
I hadn't felt even an atom of the presence of this person called Beatrice, who was supposedly standing behind me, invisible. However, I felt like I'd glimpsed a little of that presence inside Maria. You're right. When Maria starts talking about witches, her personality changes. Batlacun, you also saw it done by the beach yesterday, right? You mean that scorpion keychain? No, I don't mean like when her feelings were hurt. I'm talking about her having a dual personality or something. Yeah, that happens sometimes too. That thing Maria did when she was talking about the magic circle does happen every now and then. It's freaky though. Apparently Jessica had spotted that ki he he Maria a few times. I just happened to catch it at a bad moment and was pretty freaked out seeing it for the first time. So what is that? Does Maria have a dual personality or something? Or are you saying that her spiritual sense really is that strong and she's being possessed by a spirit or whatever? No, I don't think it's that. Haven't you ever experienced it? When you were small, didn't you ever want to be someone other than yourself? When humans are born, no one has any individ individuality. However, when they reach their growth period, their sense of self starts to be born. They want to be different from other people. But since everyone else in their class is learning the same things at the same rate and being forced into the same lifestyle, of course, they aren't going to find anything that makes them different from everyone else around them. Once they realise that, the first thing they do is start breaking the rules, in what's called the rebellious stage. Since everyone else follows the rules, they want to show off their individuality by breaking them. So even those who try to act tough, mocking everyone around them and calling them childish, actually uh, can actually be viewed as cute kids searching for themselves, if you look at it that way. I'm lecturing about all this like I'm so smart, but I actually got it secondhand from George and Nikki. I myself was one of those embarrassing guys who thought it was cool to act like a little bastard. <laughs> well, that was when I was at the age where you tried to show off for the opposite sex. The main feature of the growing period lies in an impulse to break away from your life as a kid, like a chick trying to crack open the shell of their egg. Do you know what makes children and adults different? Age? Or do you mean size? No, it's experience. Adults can look down on children because children have very little life experience. The reason they snort at everything children say is because they think kids know nothing about the real world. Yeah, I understand that. When you're a kid, you talk like you got life all figured out somehow, trying to act like an adult. No matter what kids say, adults just snort at them and say they're too naive, or that they'll understand when they get older, or something. Mm, it's probably true, but to a kid it's just annoying, like they're being looked down upon. I get it. It's a question of knowledge and experience. Well, I guess you're right that there's no reason to respect a person for their age if they've just wasted their lives. Therefore, during the period when they try to separate themselves from other children, they also try to take on personality traits different from those around them. And if knowledge and experience is what separates kids and adults, I get it, if they know something no one else knows, it becomes part of their identity. You know, when I was in elementary school, I'd learn things no one else knew, get things no one else had, wear things no one else wore, become a bit of a hero for it. I bet you've done the same thing, Battler. Yeah, yeah. There was definitely an age when I wanted to excel in some skill or other. I see, so that's because I was trying to separate myself from being a child, or going through my growing period, in other words. If you put a positive spin on it, the growing period forces you to separate yourself from others, thereby pushing you to gain skills and knowledge no one else has. This is also interesting from a sociological standpoint. Because people hate being like everyone else, they try to learn skills other people don't know. In this way, society can acquire the broad range of skills it needs to survive. The quality of the gods programming is truly surprising. Mm, unique personality traits can also be negative, right? Like if, say, everyone in the class was studying hard, but I was the only one slacking off trying to stand out. Okay, the last bit really was true about me. <laughs> it's only recently that I've been able to th uh, thank the middle school teacher who slapped me after school. But, well, I tried to jump over things no one else could. Sprint as fast as I could, trying to lap those guys with good grades when we did a marathon. I just felt like doing it. It was in my nature that if I couldn't study well, then at least I could get back at them by exercising. I see, so I really did go through a proper growing period. I guess boys really do tend to focus more on physical stuff. But you know, girls of the same age tend to focus more on mental, spiritual things. I bet there were groups of girls in their classes that got really interested in fortune telling and their spiritual senses. Yeah, yeah, they were, they were. They'd come over asking me for my sign and my blood type. And then they'd laugh. Oh, I thought so. Giggle, giggle. <laughs> it really got my nerves. No matter which class you go to, 
skills like fortune teller. Deciding whether your spirit sense is strong or weak, what your sensitivity is, whether you can see the unseeable, that kind of thing definitely happened to me. That's because fortune telling and spiritual senses are things that aren't taught in school. To girls who tend to be more introverted, it's a genre that's easy to build an identity upon, and one that holds a lot of interest for them. Just like how when boys enter their growing period, they start acting tough and rebel against adults. When girls enter their growing period, they start getting interested in that kind of thing. Mm, I didn't though. So, Maria having so much interest in the occult, isn't that rare among girls her age? Even if we accept that, I wonder if it explains that creepy dual personality thing. Actually, I think I probably could accept that explanation, more or less. As you just said, becoming an adult means gaining knowledge and experience. So, to gain that, it's necessary for children to learn all sorts of things and break free from childhood. However, there are certain convenient delusions that you see often in the world of children, both now and in the past. Do you know what I mean? You see it all the time in manga and anime, right? It's kind of like that. Like you've got memories from a previous life that start to resurface. Like you're being possessed by the soul of the great something. Or whatever. <laughs> ah, it could be that a sleeping gene gets awakened. Or maybe a sealed power or memory returns. There's all kinds. For some reason, stuff like that's really popular at that age. Why is that? All those examples you just mentioned are illusions that let children immediately add to their summer knowledge and experience. If a nine-year-old girl says she has a thousand-year-old witch possessing her, then she gains a thousand and nine-year-old identity. <laughs> so basically, studying is annoying. But these delusions are convenient for people who want to brag about having a skill no one else has, amazing the people around them. So you could brag about something without having to work hard or study. I see, it's not a kid's greatest dream. Furthermore, in their desire to separate themselves from being kids, they always project an image of their ideal self and it's not rare for that desired self to become an alternate personality. Even you, Batlakun, probably had a slightly different personality at home and at school, right? I know I did, actually. I remember. It'd probably be embarrassing if your friends at school saw how you were at home. At school, you try to project yourself as you want to be, but at home is where you're your true self. Yeah. Like, when I was younger, when I was in school, I was the study type, and I would always, you know, I'd always be studying, and, um, I still had friends and stuff, somehow. It was a weird year at school year. <laughs> um, but at home, I would be, I would just take my glasses off. I'm just like Clark Kent, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> uh, no, I'd just be into games and um, I'd go out and play and stuff. So in other words, I've changed my personality depending on the situation. Are you trying to say having multiple personalities is actually really common? A girl who's a fan of the occult might say she's being possessed or awakened. Honestly, there are some kids who change their personality so much it's creepy. And some boys do it too, right? Guys who say they've blown their top and suddenly turn into some overplayed, violent character. I bet they think it's pretty cool, but it's painful to watch. Let's sum this all up. So you're saying, even if a girl about Maria's age shows a creepy second personality like she did a minute ago, it isn't such a rare or unusual thing? Simply put, that's right. Identity is an important factor when building up one's sense of self. If you make fun of it, it could actually cause children to go back into their shells. So it's important to go along with them, to some degree. Although the broad-mindedness of the parent de determines whether they play along in full or not. Aniki, I can't believe you're single. You sound like you've already raised kids through middle school. So, I wonder if Aunt Rosa also knew much about Maria's dual personality. She knew about it. Just between us, Aunt Rosa really hated it. She said it was unpleasant, and that Maria was becoming increasingly isolated from the rest of the class. So any time Maria started talking about the occult or laughing like a witch, she'd slap her, as we saw in the garden. And it looks like Maria stopped talking that way in front of her. Maybe the thing back there was just a little game from a girl facing her growing period. Just a girl trying to show that she was different and independent by holding interest in witches and the occult. And since she wanted to be different from herself, young as she was, she was switching between a normal personality and the personality of her ideal, a witch. At first, I found that very disturbing. But after being lectured by George and Nikki, it felt like this was a path everyone walked down at one time or another. I haven't told anyone, but when I was in kindergarten, I joined up with a little gang of kids trying to form an Earth Defense Force, saying we'd help protect peace on Earth. My face turns red when I remember how, during what we called battle practice, we would chant, 
EDF, EDF. Just like usual, Maria was relaxing, immersed in the TV, ooh, ooh, in, <laughs> and laughing just like any girl her age. But on the inside, another personality, that of the ideal witch she respected and blindly accepted, was sleeping. But that wasn't anything extraordinary. It was perfectly natural for a girl of her age. I've calmed down a little. The shock from my bizarre experience in the kitchen just now is fading away. If I hadn't talked to Aniki and Jessica, I might still be frightened by the idea that an invisible witch is standing right behind me. However, can I really accept that as an explanation for what happened back there? If it had just been Maria, I could have explained it as the fickle delusions of a growing girl. But Genji-san, Kanan-kun, Kumasawa-bachan had also been there. None of them had denied what Maria said. They silently accepted that Beatrice exists. I was starting to feel a little uneasy. Aunt Eva's position was that no 19th person existed, that the crime was an inside job tied to the family quarrels. On the other hand, Aunt Natsui's position was that the culprit was hiding somewhere outside the mansion. So she rejected the possibility of an inside job and supported the idea that a 19th person existed. And in the kitchen, Maria and the servants had also supported the idea of a 19th person. But according to them, this 19th person isn't human. They said it was an invisible witch, carrying out some mysterious plan. Is there a 19th person, or not? And is the culprit human, or witch? For some reason, I couldn't just laugh off any of those possibilities. Not even the most ridiculous story about the witch. Drink time. Okay. Jessica, all I know about the story of the witch is that the adults made it up to keep the kids too scared to enter the forest. But is the story different here in the mansion? Hmm. I feel the same way you do, okay? I think it was just a stupid ghost story the parents made up so the kids would listen to them. But I can't deny that the atmosphere inside the mansion makes it a little hard to say it out loud. After all, Grandfather has proclaimed that Beatrice exists, and because of their pos position, the servants can't doubt that. Even Uncle Klaus and Aunt Natsui don't want to get into a fight with him, so on the surface they go along with it. So it's probably fair to say that doubt in the existence of Beatrice is taboo to those who live and work in this mansion. Unlike the rest of us, who only come here once a year. Is that right? Jessica took a deep breath in admi admiration. Mm -hmm. Looked like Aniki had guessed it right. It's just like you say. No one really believes it on the inside. But on the outside, they accept that she exists. See, it's just like the way some people are about God. Even if they know God doesn't exist, they feel like it would be uncouth if they actually said it out loud. How do you think the servants feel about it? Are they just going along with it because Grandfather, their employer, says that she exists? No. I don't really know the details. But between the servants, the story about Beatrice has been treated like a sort of ghost story. Remember yesterday, when Shannon was talking to us down by the beach? The story about how one night, when she was doing the rounds in the mansion, she saw something unsettling? She did say something like that, didn't she? Back then, I thought she was just being really nice to help improve Maria's mood. But it felt like she was serious when she said it. That's right, she definitely said it. She definitely said the same kind of thing that Genji and the rest had all unanimously declared back in the kitchen. In addition, some servants have also seen will-o'-the-wisps and glittering butterflies dancing around. Kanakun also saw something like that when he went patrolling one night. And recently, you often hear servants talking about strange footsteps heard inside the mansion near midnight. We've whispered together that the Beatrice Summer in the portrait sometimes makes herself invisible and walks through the mansion. It happened a while ago. But even I have heard footsteps while patrolling at night that resemble these stories. That's right, she definitely said that. Exactly the same thing that I had been told just now. Ah, but there's nothing to be afraid of. Beatrice Sama is another ruler of this mansion, separate from the master. So there's no need to be unnaturally afraid. If you respect her, I hear she won't do anything bad. However, she can be quite terrifying if you don't respect her, right? Correct. I've heard that just before I began working here, someone who spoke badly about Beatrice Sama fell down the stairs and quit after receiving a large injury to their back. Because of that, there was a rumour between the servants that Beatrice Sama's anger had been brought down upon this person. If you don't respect her, you'll suffer her wrath and get hurt. 
So to the servants, Beatrice's existence is just as credible as a story that if you pull pranks on Inari-san, you'll receive Kitsune-sama's curse. No idea. Of course, even though everyone accepts that curses and like don't exist in the modern era, people are still afraid and still have a little respect for them. You often see it when, in a residential area, someone's building a house and they call a Shinto priest for a ceremony to honour the god of that plot of land. You might think that was just a big waste of time and money, but it's said that if the workers don't do that, a big accident will occur, so they never neglect to do it. You also hear about how if an Inari shrine is carelessly removed during a town replanning, they'd be accursed by Kitsune-sama. I think I might have read somewhere that when the occupying forces were trying to expand an airport, they tried to remove an Inari-san that was in the way, and the workers kept getting struck down by mysterious fe fevers. Even in modern cities like Tokyo, it wasn't rare to see modern buildings packed all around an old Inari shrine, leaving the shrine itself untouched. And this wasn't limited to Japan, probably similar to how foreigners baptise babies. If I remember right, by Christian doctrine, if unbaptised souls have even the slightest amount of sin, they'll still go to hell. Oh, that's me gone. <laughs> Putting water on a child's forehead doesn't do anything but make them cry. But if by doing just that, parents can prevent their children from going to hell, they happily go through with that ceremony. In short, even in this modern society of reason, we were still unable to throw away every trace of belief and fear. You could even say that we accept certain sorts of supernatural things, though in a passive way. Maybe the only difference on this island is that Beatrice is the object of that worship. So in other words, if anything happens that doesn't seem explainable in human terms, it's called the work of Beatrice. I think Shannon Chan said it herself. Windows and doors and locks that were tightly shut would be open the next time you went to check them. Lights that should have been on went out. Lights that should have been out were turned on. And if I remember, even Jessica was joking about it, saying it was also the work of Beatrice when she couldn't find her bag in the morning. Your memory's pretty good. Normally, you'd say some little limps took them, but on this island, it's Beatrice. It's all pretty stupid, though. This mansion has been standing for about 30 years by now, hasn't it? It's natural for things that old to get their fair share of ghost and occult stories, like the seven mysteries at a school. That's where I'll spin the chessboard around. Hmm? Simply put, on this island, there's a rule that Beatrice gets blamed for anything that couldn't have been done by humans. Things that humans can't do. How many humans are here? 18. In other words, the culprits using the rules of this island to make it look like a witch committed this crime which proves that they desperately want us to think a 19th person did it. I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. What do you mean you don't like it? Let's assume some invisible 19th person exists and wants people to know they exist. If it were me, I'd do it with even more perfect timing. What do you mean by perfect timing? Well, the crime took place sometime between the middle of the night and dawn, right? We had some people who were talking together until the middle of the night, some people on night shifts, and some people who'd returned to their rooms and were sleeping. Everyone's alibi is really vague, so there's plenty of room to suspect that the crime was an inside job. George and Nikki, and Eva probably told you too, right? That there's a good chance this crime was an inside job. Mm, yes. I guess. In other words, if this invisible 19th person really exists and wants to let us know, this first crime was a complete failure. No, in the first place, they chose the wrong time of day to do it. If this invisible 19th person really wanted to show themselves, they had to make sure that the crime took place under conditions which proved that the remaining 12 people were all innocent. As long as it's a single human we can suspect, this 19th person's attempt to highlight their presence fails. That's why near midnight, when everyone's alibis are at their vaguest, the 19th person's existence is also at its vaguest. And yet, the culprit chose to commit the crime at that time. By committing the crime then, one of the 18 could obviously be suspected, and yet someone handed Maria the letter and called themselves a witch, even though everyone denies they did it. In other words, you're trying to say that one of the 18 is trying to make it look like a 19th person called Beatrice exists? That's a pretty crazy idea. I think Mum's theory about someone hiding outside the mansion is a bit more credible. Battler, don't tell me you actually think someone in this room is the culprit. I do. Someone's trying to force us to accept that Beatrice exists. That's right, this whole thing started as far back as the letter last night. I don't have any basis or proof. 
but with the chessboard turned around, this is my best guess. Seriously, that's too crazy. You sure you haven't been reading too many weird detective novels? However, it's an angle we can't ignore. Whether there's a 90th person or not, the culprit's definitely planning something involving that rule about this island. Just now, listening to Batla can talk, I remembered something that's a little disturbing. Something disturbing? Yes. Do you remember? Beatrice's letter. It said that Beatrice was going to collect interest. And by interest, it mentioned everything of the Ashuramaya family. Jessica and I thought back on what Maria had read aloud the previous night. Yeah, it said that. It definitely said that. That the collection of the interest was going to take place shortly. But if the riddle of the gold could be solved, she'd lose that right. Grandfather received the gold and rebuilt the Ashuramaya family. In other words, according to Beatrice, everything created using the gold as capital counts as part of the interest. Which means... That's pretty scary for a joke, Aniki. You don't mean everything of the Ashuramaya family. In other words, everything that Grandfather gave birth to. In other words, everyone with Grandfather's blood flowing through their veins. If you interpret the letter that way, these murders are just Beatrice legitimately collecting interest. If that's the case, these crimes will continue, because the collection of interest is still only halfway completed. George turned around, looking over the parlour. There were still many people who held the name of Shuramaya. And because Godasan and Shannon Chan had been killed, we knew that not even the servants were safe, despite lacking the Ashuramaya name. So are they planning to kill us all? But that's weird, George Nissan. In that case, why only six people? They should have been able to kill a lot more. At worst, it should have been possible for them to assault everyone while they were sleeping and kill them in a single night. Why didn't they do that? The special clause. If someone manages to solve the, the riddle of the gold, their right to the interest will be lost. And remember how the letter ended. It challenged us all to solve the riddle of Grandfather's gold. Jesus. Looks like we're finally understanding the culprit's message. In other words, the culprit's telling us to try and solve the riddle on that epitaph Grandfather's made. On top of that, they're saying that if we just sit around, they'll keep collecting the interest. I realise this is all based on several guesses that are way out there. But not everything that happens in this world fits together in a perfect line. Most of the events we don't understand are only individual points. By fitting them into a straight line, we begin to understand. When the points at either end of the line are really close, the line itself is more logical and easier to understand. And when those points are really far away, the opposite's true. It's the distance between these points that makes us say our guesses are way out there. However, if the distances we span are too narrow, that means our thinking will be narrow too. Is there a difference between making guesses and reasoning? Am I just using easily made guesses to try and force this crime into a pattern I can understand? No, that's not it. When you're lost in the dark and searching around with your hands, what you're doing is relying on your imagination and making guesses. Only imagination can find the points that need to be tied together. Reasoning is nothing more than the act of drawing lines between them. If you can't imagine, you can't reason. What I'm doing now might be a way out there, or might be way out there, but I'm sure it isn't a mistake either. Only the power of imagination can pull clues out from the distance, and then I can use the power of reasoning to tie those clues together. It is a lot like the process of searching out an enemy's weak spot and striking. I've been playing too much Persona, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> it's okay if I'm way out there. Find a weak point first, then we can think about how to strike. Right now is the time to find points we can tie together later. Give me two seconds, I need to have a break. <laughs> okay, I'm back. For the time being, I put aside whether the 19th person existed, and announced our theory that the goal of the culprit might have been to make us solve the riddle of the epitaph. Uncle Hideyoshi seemed to be extremely interested, but Aunt Nsui said it was ridiculous and dismissed it. Of course, if you think about it that way, even that letter from yesterday makes sense. That motive seems to fit pretty well with the facts, setting aside whoever it was that gave Maria Chan the letter. Oh, Beatrice exists. Oh. Even though she was puffing up her cheeks in that cute way she'd been doing since yesterday, I couldn't think of it as cute. If I poked fun at her, it might suddenly transform into a creepy laugh. There's no hidden gold. However, if the culprit's blindly sure of its existence, 
and if they're trying to make us solve the riddle before snatching the gold away from themselves, then I'll agree it makes sense. However, if that were the case, why would they start by killing those most highly ranked in the Ashuramaya family? I see a point. If they wanted to make us solve the riddle, killing those closest to Kinzo-san doesn't sound like a good plan to me. That's true enough. And if we're going to go in with that argument, wouldn't it have been quicker to threaten father in the first place? You'd think it'd be faster to just ask the person who wrote it, rather than try to force us to solve it. You got a point there. Still, I think it'd take more than your average threat to make father spill the beans. Anyone who knows Kinzo-san well would probably realise that he won't bow to ordinary threats. He's the man who bears responsibility for the Ashuramaya family and all its vast wealth. He's been exposed to many threats and attacks in the past. The family only prospers today because he was able to overcome all of them. That's freaking right! I can't, I can't even imagine our grandfather obeying someone because of a threat. Jessica, watch your language. <laughs> yes, ma'am. In that case, what about this idea? No, wait, is this one also way out there? I couldn't hesitate. Outdoor ideas are like bows and arrows. It might be hard to hit with, but it's a great weapon, because you can hit enemies far away. They say most people who've died in battles were killed by arrow wounds. In a battle, you can't just shoot off one arrow. You shoot a whole bunch of arrows at once, pushing forwards towards the enemy troops with a wall of them. So keep shooting, over and over. Create a wall as you push forwards towards the truth. If the culprits after the hidden gold, forcing us to solve the riddle wouldn't be very efficient for them. It'd be much quicker and easier to ask the person who made it in the first place. In that case, the question is, is this all a message directed to Grandfather? In other words, these murders were a threat made against Grandfather. If he didn't tell the culprit where the gold was, his family members would be killed off one by one. What if we weren't the only ones being forced to solve this riddle? What if Grandfather was too? If you think about it that way, it explains Grandfather's mysterious disappearance. If the culprit has already attacked Grandfather, and judged by the state the six corpses were left in, he should have been left on display somewhere with that horrible makeup added. But despite that, we still haven't found him. So does that mean Grandfather has been kidnapped and has been held somewhere? How could? You aren't saying, how could? Giggle, giggle. <laughs> that sounds interesting. So Grandfather's being confined somewhere. And the culprit's saying we'll be killed off one by one if he doesn't tell them where the gold is. It pains me to imagine how you find that interesting. Aunt Natsui glared at her, but Aunt Eva just smiled calmly. Since we still haven't seen him after all this time, I think it's almost certain that Grandfather's gotten caught up in the crime. If you think about it, you can't just ignore Battlecon's theory, right? Be quiet, George. In the first place, when did Father actually disappear? Who was the last person to see Father? It was probably me. This morning, when we didn't know where my husband and the rest were, we discussed the possibility of them being in Father's study, and I went to check his room and greeted him there. Come to think of it, I've been holding the key to his study this whole time, haven't I? Genji, let me return this to you. Aunt Natsui pulled out the gold key, handed it to Genji. Looking at the key, Aunt Eva giggled. Hey Genji-san, I'm sure the police will inspect Father's room thoroughly. If there's anything hidden in there, it'll just be exposed anyway. So maybe it'd be better if you just told us about it right here, right now. What are you talking about? It's simple. Father's study is a closed room, with no way in or out except for that key, right? I want to verify whether that's true. There's one entrance to Father's study. What about the window? Any other entrances or exits? There are none. There's no way to get in except the entrance. You are sure about that? There isn't some secret hidden door or anything? Since Father isn't here, I'm the highest ranked member of the Ashuramaya family. I'm asking you as a representative of the Ashuramaya family head. Remember that when you answer me. Are there any ways in or out of that room, other than the main entrance? As Father's closest aide, I'm sure you would know. Aunt Natsui looked a little offended at the part about the highest ranked family member. But she kept her mouth closed for the time being, and waited for Genji's answer. I couldn't help but feel a little uncomfortable. Why was she going on and on about hidden doors? You too, Kanakun, Kumasawa-san. If you know, won't you tell me? If there is one, it'd be better if you said so. Otherwise, a certain person might be driven into a corner in a second. If we assume that there is a hidden door, then my argument comes to nothing. Aunt Eva didn't specify which person was about to be driven into a corner. 
but following the flow of the conversation, I had to feel that she was referring to Aunt Natsui. Mother, what are you talking about? George, stay quiet for a bit. What do you say? Genji-san? Kanakun? Kumasawa-san? Is there a hidden door? Or not? Genji-san? When you remodeled f Father's study, you must have overseen the construction. I won't let you say you don't know. There's nothing like that in the Master's study. You're sure? Oh, Kanakun. One who's allowed to wear the one-winged eagle. That's right. I'm sure. There is no such hidden door in the master's study. Kamasawa-san? No, I haven't heard of such a thing. What well, with Dr. Nanjo? You've had a close relationship with Father. I have never heard of something like that. Very well, then. So are you ready? Let me begin. It's very simple. Everyone ti tilted their head doubtfully, wondering what Aunt Eva was starting to talk about so proudly. It can only be trouble if it's Eva. Aunt Eva laughed triumphantly, as though she were about to reveal a secret on she knew. Natsui Nisan was the last person to spot Father, right? I forget the exact time, but I think it was a little before nine in the morning. Nisan, do you remember? I ran into you just as you were coming out of Father's study, right? Yes, I remember. What's that have to do with anything? When was the next time you went to visit Father's study? That was after we found the bodies of Nissan and the rest, right? Together with me, you went up to the study to report that. We discovered that she, he wasn't there. By the way, Nissan, at that time, when you went to enter Father's study, did you notice anything? Notice anything? What are you talking about? Yeah, Mum. You picked up some trash, right? A folded receipt? I do so seem to remember picking up some trash. How is that relevant? I got that receipt when I bought some candy at the store before arriving at the airport. Aunt Eva pulled a small bag of candy out of her handbag. Ah, the receipt from the candy you bought back there. But mother, what's that receipt have to do with anything? George, stay quiet and listen for just a bit longer. Uncle Hideyoshi's expression was a little strict. Apparently, he understood what Aunt Eva was getting at. It really was just a whim. I definitely didn't foresee anything. Or tried to set up a trap for Natsui Nisan or anything like that. Actually, about that receipt. Nisan, you remember bumping into me right after the last time you saw Father, right? At that time, I wedged this into the door to the study. So what's that mean? You saying no one opened the door until Aunt Natsui picked up that receipt? Wait a second, Aunt Eva. Wedging a receipt in would be obvious. It's possible that when Grandfather opened the door, he noticed it, found it amusing, stuck it back in the door. Jessica hurriedly argued back. She still didn't really know what this all meant. But she realised that, whatever it was, it would raise suspicions about her own mother. Of course, I folded the receipt up very small so that no one would notice it. But even if you assume that he saw it fall, he would have no way of knowing how high up the door it had been stuck, right? I checked it while Natsui Nisan was, talk was taking the key out. The receipt was still stuck, not one millimetre away from where I put it. I can't understand why you would pull such a childish prank. I'll bet you were the one who did that prank on the door to my room too. The door to your room? It was unpleasant to talk about, so I never mentioned it. But when I woke up this morning, there were the signs of some prank on the outside of my door, with what was probably the same red paint that was scribbled across the shutter. There were some unpleasant marks as though someone had been tearing at the door. Wait, what's this? Why did you keep quiet about this till now? My apologies. Since so many horrible things have occurred since then, I've completely forgotten about this until this morning. Ah, this mo moment. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. I'm not talking about your door, but the door to Father's room, right? Between the time you confirmed that he was in his room and the time we confirmed that he wasn't, that door wasn't opened even once. How did Father get out if he didn't use the door? I don't know that. That's what I want to know. Natsui san other than you, who else checked to see whether Father was in his room? Last night, the last time I met Kinzo-san was when we were playing chess, so I was with him until just before dinner. Who saw him after that? I did. I gave him his dinner last night. Yes. Shannon and I were with him. So at that time, Father was still definitely in his room. However, Natsui Nisan, when you found out that he wasn't there, it looks like all ways in or out of the study were closed, right? But even so, you said you met with him this morning. I don't understand why everyone's become so gloomy. Could someone please explain it to me? Father and Mother. Are you saying that what Natsui says about meeting Grandfather this morning? 
was a lie. Like hell she'd lie about that. Mum's guiltless. Why would she lie? Jessica, I keep telling you to watch your language. All at once the whole room was in an uproar. Aunt Eva and Aunt Nasui confronted each other across the parlour table, with George confronting Jessica. What the heck's going on? Many people spotted him last night, right? But since this morning, the only one who claims to have seen Father is Natsui Nisan. And then, there's that strange fact we learned from my receipt. So how can we connect these points together? Aunt Eva urged everyone to imagine it. Sure that receipt could become an important point. But I didn't know which other points to tie it to, or how. If we try searching for the answer Aunt Eva probably wants, we'll find that Aunt Natsui lied and acted as though Grandfather was in his room this morning. Has that fact been exposed by a whim of Aunt Eva's? I don't get it at all. Why would Mum have to lie? She had no reason to, right? That's what I want to know. But Jessica-chan, you can't be sure she had no reason to lie and say the grandfather was in the room. After all, you see it in mystery novels every now and then. That trick where people fake their time of death to create an alibi for themselves. What are you talking about? I've never heard of that. We still haven't found Father yet, but it's pretty natural to assume he's already been killed. If that's true, there's no doubt we'll find his corpse soon. If at that point the time of death could be cleverly faked, Natsui Nisan would be able to create an alibi. Do you understand? Everyone? This morning, when Aunt Natsui confirmed that Grandfather was there, she lied. And he was already dead at that time. And then she moved the body to some other location and tampered with it so that when we find it, we'll think he was killed just a second ago. That'd make it possible for her to create an alibi even just by staying with the rest of us. Then she could say I heard someone screaming, dash over there and become the first to find the body along with everyone else. Is that what Aunt Eva's saying? Ridiculous. After all, detective novels are merely books for the purpose of entertainment. You can only think of such an indiscreet idea because you read them all the time. That's right. Even if she did try to fake the time of death a little, all that would be blown away in an instant once the police did their autopsy. That might have worked in the past, but you really think that kind of trick would work in modern Japan? It does make sense. You think so? This morning, when Dr. Nanjo looked at the corpses, he was only able to give a vague estimate of the time of death, right? Autopsy results are very easily affected by the environment and individual differences. It's a very relative estimate with an uncertainty of several hours. And unfortunately, the police's scientific investigation will have to wait until tomorrow. It wouldn't be easy to measure the correct time of death so accurately, even in modern Japan. Isn't that right, Dr. Nanjo? Examining a corpse is an extremely difficult task that requires both experience and instinct. I've heard that there is a very high chance of a mistaken diagnosis. I imagine it's very possible for a misreading of just a few hours to occur. However, for an alibi, that's more than enough. It's an old trick. It's a trick that works well enough. Natsuini-san, it's not like we want to suspect you, okay? We just want you to prove your innocence so we don't have to suspect you. What's this innocence you want me to prove? This morning, I definitely met with Father. And he told me to keep the one-winged evil engraved in my heart. You denying that he said that too? I'll certainly not permit that. I won't let you deny that Father said those words. Maybe Father's body won't appear anyway. Normally, a person has to be missing for seven years before they're officially dead. Wouldn't that be a clever way to extend Father's nearly finished life for another seven years? Keep all of his wealth for yourself? I can't let you get away with saying that. Oh god, the animation even went. I can't let you get away with any with saying any more. Emma Shuramaya Natsui. Although I do not have the right to wear the one-winged eagle on my body, it's certainly engraved on my heart. What do you think you're saying to the wife of Kraus, successor to the head, and the one who will act as such in his place? What's this? You gonna shoot me with that gun? Go ahead. If only you just shoot. You're just desperate because you can't think of a way out, right? Do it. Just try to obscure the truth with violence. You! It wasn't like Aunt Natsui had been actually holding that gun at the ready and threatening anyone. But as she was egged on by Aunt Eva, she did hold it at the ready. Unsurprisingly, once things got to the stage, Jessica and Genji-san tried to stop her. Madam, please calm yourself. Mom, you aren't lying. So there's no reason for you to listen to this. Calm down, Natsui-tan. All you've got to do is swear that Father definitely was in that room. Why are you getting so worked up? That's correct. Natsui-san isn't lying. Shouldn't that be the end of it? Then I want you to explain. How did Father manage to disappear from the room? 
The window was closed tight from the inside. The same was true for the door, right? This morning, if you really met with Father, then you must explain how Father disappeared from this unopenable door, closed room scenario. If you don't, that'd mean you're lying after all, right? How far do you plan to mock me? If you want to argue back, go ahead. That's right, try explaining it right here, right now. If you do, I'll apologise for su suspecting you. How did Father manage to get out from that closed room? I cannot explain, and there's no need for me to do so. Really? Then let me explain it. Let's take the best parts from my perspective and yours and come up with a more friendly explanation. I'll believe what he said about Father still being in this room this morning. However, the next time the door was opened, Father wasn't there. You don't have any objections so far, right? I have no desire to hear anything more you have to say. Shut your frivolous mouth. My reasoning goes like this, okay? I can confirm that on both occasions, you were the only one to go through that door. And the receipt proves it. So what's the answer to the puzzle of how Father left the room? The window. He was sent out the window. Natsuini-san, you threw Father out the third story window of the study into the courtyard. You! Madam, please endure it. Iwasama, please stop this. After that, when you left and said you were going to check the doors and windows, you took Father's corpse, which had fallen into the courtyard, and hid it. That was probably when he took some measures to fake the time of death, right? This ties in with the case regarding Kraus Nissan and the rest, and also the case regarding Beatrice last night. There's a really good chance we got reason to suspect Natsui-san in all those cases. Normally, I wouldn't want to say this. But now that it's out in the open, there's nothing else I can do. Please, Natsui Nisan, please explain how you can be innocent. Otherwise, I can't help but suspect you. Why me? Why must I, Ashura Maya, Natsui, be insulted like this? Hmm. Looks like we've got everyone's views on record now. <laughs> it's useless. It's all useless. Aunt Eva. What do you mean, useless? Jessica looked up at me, hanging on to my every word. Aunt Eva's expression was confident as ever. Useless, you say? What is? Battlekun? Tell me. You're only convinced it was Aunt Natsui because you're only looking at the case from a single angle. It's not like I'm defending her, but that bluff of a checkmate isn't going to fly. I think your reasoning regarding that receipt was passable. It's not a bad thread of logic, but I'd only give it a grade of 65 at best. If this were an exam, that'd be bad enough to get you extra lessons in detention, right? Oh my. Well, how do you think anyone could break through the door sealed by my receipt and make Father disappear? Other than by my theory. It's true that your theory is an interesting one. And if you could say for sure that there were no way to make Grandfather disappear, then you probably would be able to prove that the last person to see him, Aunt Natsui, was guilty. However, since there still is a possibility she's innocent and these accusations are false, we can't be sure about that. Hmm, in Battlekun, you saying someone other than Natsui Nisan made Grandfather disappear? It'd be impossible for anyone else to do it. My receipt proved that, right? After the first time she visited that study, and until the second time when we visited it together, the study was a perfect closed room, and when the seal was broken on the closed room, he was already missing. If that doesn't prove she's the culprit, what kind of trick could they have used? Like I said, Aunt Eva, only 65 points, so let's try spinning the chessboard around, shall we? The question isn't how someone managed to make Grandfather disappear from the outside. We should think about how Grandfather disappeared from the inside. The door had the receipt stuck in it, so it couldn't have been used. He also couldn't have gone through the window because you can't lock it from the outside. When Aunt Eva visited the study, she checked to make sure it was locked. So the window also wasn't used. At that point, the study really was a closed room. You have to accept this. However, the study didn't remain a closed room forever. Once the, sealed, the seal created by the receipt was removed, it would be possible for, for someone to escape by the door. In other words, the question isn't how Aunt Natsui made Grandfather disappear. We need to think about how he was able to escape. Grandfather's study isn't an ordinary study, right? According to Genji-san, there's a toilet and a kitchen and even a bedroom, almost like a little house. For example, what if he was hiding under the bed and the two of you only thought he was missing? And Eva, even you didn't check that far, right? And then the two of you went back down the stairs, thinking he wasn't there. That time, the receipt was already gone. In other words, if Grandfather was hiding in this room the whole time it was a closed room, and escaped after letting the two of you go past him, we can crack this closed room right open. What are you talking about? Why would Father need to escape the room in such a bizarre fashion? Don't be so absurd. Yeah, it might be absurd, 
However, it still shows that there's a possibility Aunt Natsui is being falsely accused. Your receipt wasn't perfect. In chess, we might call that check, but it isn't checkmate. But the thing that really pisses me off is how you're pressuring Aunt Natsui to explain it and claiming that she must be guilty if she doesn't. If you want to go down that road, then why don't you let me? You show my battler spin the chessboard around one more time. And Eva, according to your own argument, you must explain to us why you and Uncle Hideyoshi couldn't have been killed. Uh, couldn't have killed those six last night, and then casually returned to the guest house. You've been trying to force Aunt Natsui to explain, so I'm sure you can prove your own innocence, right? Especially now that all of Grandfather's wealth has suddenly plopped down right in your hands. That's right. You're suspicious enough yourself, aren't you? If you say Mum's suspicious because she was the last person to see him, then what about you, Aunt Natsui? Uh, Aunt Eva, the last person to see Dad and the rest? Just like Battler said, prove that you two weren't the ones who killed them. Mother, I also think your reasoning was a little over-eager. I'm sure the receipt was an important hint. But like Battler kun said, that's not enough to prove that Aunt Natsui was responsible for some plot. We're all equally suspicious. It's not right for only Aunt Natsui to be persecuted. Our proud father crawling under his bed. You call nonsense like that an explanation? In that case, why don't you explain first? Who killed those six and how? And then try showing us proof that you weren't involved. Oh, Jessica's coughing. Ooh. Milady, Milady. Jessica suddenly started coughing. At first, I thought she was just choking after yelling too loud, but before long, I realized how painful it looked. Jessica kept coughing and choking, down on her hands and knees. Jessica, hang in there. Dr. Nanjo. Jessica-san, you inhaler, quickly. No, wait, I have one with me. So just like your mother, like Natsui, she's a bit... Jessica is a little bit frailer, uh, or got an illness, or, you know. Dr. Nanjo pulled a bronchial... bronchodilator inhaler from his own bag, which was lying on the sofa, handed it to Jessica. Come to think of it, six years ago, didn't Jessica sometimes break into violent coughing fits and have to use that? However, six years ago, I never saw Jessica look like she was in this much pain. Aniki, was Jessica's asthma always this bad? It's gotten a lot worse these last few years. It's no problem when she's normal. But when an attack comes suddenly, she can't stop coughing anymore. <coughs> oh. My lady, your medicine. Here. Mm. Cough, cough. Taking the inhaler from Kanakun, Jessica used it with a practiced hand. It looked like her throat would still itch for a while, but she had it under control. You okay, Jessica? You scared me. It's no big deal. Don't worry about it. Beads of sweat covered Jessica's whole body, and she couldn't hide her rough breathing, but it looked like her sudden attack had calmed down for now. This disturbance had made the dangerous atmosphere up until now seem slightly unfocused. That's fine. That kind of battle of mutual suspicion is completely unnecessary. When you think about it, finding alibis for each other and looking for the culprit is probably meaningless. After all, we're just powerless, ordinary people. When the police come tomorrow, they'll definitely uh, employ cutting edge techniques and investigate the case thoroughly, solving all the riddles and arresting the culprit. Perhaps Battlecon's right after all. Just as Natsui Nissan suspicious, I can't ignore the fact that I'm suspicious too. Arguing about that now will surely be unproductive. Everything will be fine if we just leave it to the police tomorrow. But don't you want to know too, Batlacoon, who the culprit is? Don't you want to let them know the pain you feel from losing someone precious to you as soon as possible? I won't deny that. Even one day would be too long to let the wonderful bastard who's behind this go. But that doesn't mean that I want to suspect one of the 18. Even though I said what I said earlier, I don't even want to suspect you, Aunt Eva. To me, you're an awesome aunt who's always fun and playful. I don't want to trade insults with an aunt like that. I wouldn't want to do that with anyone here. Right? Everyone? I feel the same way as Bat looking. It's pointless to trade insults. It's probably just the stress built up because so many people have been crammed in one place this morning. Uh, since morning. Probably. It's only natural. It may not be my place to say it, but I think we should all relax as much as possible. Eva? I think we'd better cool our heads too. The receipt's definitely a big clue for figuring out how father disappeared. We should tell the police about it when they come. That's right. Right. 
I just felt a little triumphant when I figured out that part with the receipt. Of course, it isn't fair to only suspect Natsui Nissan, right? Just as suspicious. But still, Batlucken, at least the part about the receipt is real, okay? Don't forget it. And try thinking deeply about what it means one more time, okay? Aunt Vern and Chloe Dior, she stood up. Looked like they planned on leaving the parlour. In the end, it's pointless for us to keep playing detectives. After all, the police will reveal everything anyway. That's right. Even if we don't play this detective game, the typhoon will pass. And when those lively seagulls return to the harbour, everything will settle itself. That's right. If you think about it, this kind of crime is completely trivial. Definitely be resolved. Even if we do nothing. When the seagulls cry. Natsui Nisan, I take it you don't want to see my face anymore? I feel the same. If I remember correctly, yesterday, we had some rooms prepared for us in the mansion, so we wouldn't need to go back to the guest house, right? Those should each have a bath and a toilet, as well as a lock and chain to secure the door. There's even a bed to lie on, and my husband will be able to watch TV without having to fight with Maria-chan over which channel to watch, right? Do whatever you want, but make sure to be cautious. Thank you, Nissan. And mind your own business. I'll be counting on you to keep an eye on everyone, okay? Because the culprit's definitely here. And Nissan, make sure you don't forget to keep an eye on yourself, too. Have you finished taking your part in shots? Yes, I'm finished. See you, Natsui Nissan. Genji-san, let's know when it's time for dinner. Till then, we'll lock ourselves in with the chain. Genji, Cannon, escort them to the guest room. We'll be fine. I hate shady escorts. In fact, I'd be more comfortable if nobody leaves this room until we reach ours. Let's go, George. I'll stay here with everyone. George, the culprit's in this room. Do you plan on staying in a place like that? Leaving this room would be the same as suspecting one of my relatives. I can't believe anyone in our family is capable of something that horrible. Well, Eva's not exactly the nicest of people. Let's be real here. George, darling, you tell him too. George is already an adult man. If his code tells him not to leave this room, then it's up to him. Let him do what he wants. Father. Aunt Eva and Uncle Hideyoshi left. The only voice that called after them was the sound of the rain. The parlour was being buried beneath the savage atmosphere. When I looked at the clock, I was surprised to find that it was already evening. Had we really spent that much time worrying about needless things, talking with each other, fighting with each other? Feeling bored, I started scratching at my head when Maria and I made eye contact. I was a little surprised, since I thought she was completely immersed in the TV. I believe it now. Hmm? The letter, the murders, everything. It was all Beatrice. In fact, I almost feel like begging her to come out and take credit for it all. I want it to be the work of a 19th person. Otherwise, the 18 of us will have to keep on suspecting each other. I think believing in a 19th person is better than that. Bringing your grandfather outside without opening the doors or windows must be a piece of cake for Beatrice, right? Maria, after taking a single short breath, hung her head, then raised her face again. That's right! Kihihi! <laughs> Locking the door is useless against a witch! Beatrice is familiar with all 72 demons! The 33rd ranked, Gap, gives the power to instantly carry the desired person to any location. To her, taking a person out of any closed room isn't hard at all, you see? Kihihi! <laughs> Which is sure are incredible. Tell her, if she feels like committing another crime, do it in a way that no human could. Make me believe that a 19th person exists. No, a witch exists. Kiki. <laughs> okay. If I meet her, I'll tell her. Crap. Nothing's made sense to me for a while now. Just when I want to believe in a 19th person, I deny it. Just when I want to believe there are only 18 people, I deny that too. Even though I want there to be more than just the 18 people here, I can't accept the existence of that 19th person. In short, even though there are more than 18 people, there are less than 19. The number of people in this mansion is 19. Uh, less than 19, greater than 18. So the number of people can't be represented by an integer. However, it's impossible for there to be anything after the decimal point. You shouldn't be able to show the number of people with anything but an integer. And yet 19... But, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> and yet that. How do you explain the fraction less than one? It's no wonder. The 19th person was something that couldn't be seen. That's why, since you can only write the number of people as an integer, you couldn't see that person. That which cannot be seen, because Beatrice has no body. Therefore, she is invisible. Is there a 19th person or not? Does the witch exist or not? The witch exists somewhere in that X. <laughs> X being less than 19, greater than 18. Hey, hey. That was a hell of an argument. That was a long argument. <laughs> Go straight to 7 o'clock next as well. 7 p.m. It's coming up to night time again. Anyways. We're going to leave it off there, because God knows the episodes of this series are, just, you know, they're going to be long by the looks of it. Look how dark it is out. Anyway, this has been Greeny XI. Hope you've enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you again in a bit when we see how the family are now that night time's come in, now that Eva and Hideyoshi have left. Uh, you know, when we, we, we carry on. <laughs> Thanks again for watching, folks. See you again in a bit.